Shelter and Solidarity, a deep dive with artists and activists during this COVID pandemic. I'm your host, Joe Ramsey, live streaming and Zooming with you here from Dorchester, Massachusetts on the south side of Boston, as we are now into our fourth month of this shelter in place. Our show today, Shelter and Solidarity number 14, focuses on the topic of what must fall and what must be built, public monuments and public art in our time. For those who have been on planet Earth and watching the news or involved in the streets, you know this time we've been living through has been a time in the United States and beyond of widespread upheaval and widespread mass protests. Most recently, these last few weeks and months devoted to challenging police violence and systemic racism in the wake of the murder of, among others, George Floyd. One of the expressions of this rebellion has taken the form of targeting public monuments and public art, public or at least what may have claimed to have been public art that has been seen as offensive and reprehensible to the spirit of anti-racism that has been sweeping this country. I probably don't need to tell those who are listening and watching right now that there have been numerous monuments to Confederate leaders, Confederate soldiers, monuments to the Confederacy and to slaveholding, as well as statues of conquistadors, including Christopher Columbus himself, that have been torn down, vandalized, marked by, um, by various etchings associated with the anti-racist movement. And, and that's really just the start of the list. I know here in Boston, uh, we had a, a, a statue of Christopher Columbus beheaded, and shortly after that, removed by the state after the people beheaded it. Not the first time that Columbus has been beheaded in the city of Boston, but the first time that the statue itself was removed. Clearly, this is a moment uh, that raises all kinds of interesting issues about our public spaces, about the history of how the monuments that we see in many of our public spaces have come to be, who has made the decisions to bring those monuments into being, and how are those monuments now being seen differently in light of this recent uprising. We are really blessed today to have three terrific guests, all with a connection to Boston, but also beyond here, scholars and activists to help us dig in to this important and I think very timely topic. Uh, in the order that they will present in a moment, we have uh, first Demita Frazier. Demita Frazier, for those who don't know, is a thought leader, public intellectual and lifelong social justice activist. She is a founder of the Kumbaya River Collective and a co-author of the Kumbaya River Collective Statement, which has recently been republished on an edited collection brought together by Kianga Yamada Taylor. She remains an unrepentant, radical black feminist insurrectionary devoted to the demise of white supremacy. And I understand she has a history of thinking about statues as well. Thank you for being here, Demita. Thank you so much, I'm, I'm so pleased. Great. Demita, we'll come back to you in just a moment. Our second speaker will be Ross Caputi. Ross Caputi is a PhD student in history at UMass Amherst, a UMass, uh, UMass colleague of, of mine. Uh, here, I'm here at UMass Boston. He's out at Amherst. Um, he is uh, someone who specializes in Italian as well as US history. Uh, and we'll be talking, shedding some light from across the pond and from the United States on the on the status of, of Columbus uh, today. He's also an Iraq War veteran who has authored a book on the Iraq War invasion. I want to get the, the title of that book right. Uh, it is called The Sacking of Fallujah, A People's History. Uh, so we have in, in Ross a, a, great, a great multitude of voices here. Ross, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Great. Last but certainly not least, we have someone who should be familiar to you if he isn't already, one of the co-producers of this show, Seren Mudliar, who wears many hats and today will be joining us on this side of the camera, um, on the front side of the camera, if you will, uh, for the first time. Seren is also co-author of a newly released book I'm very excited about, planning to teach this fall. I hope others will join me in that. It's called A People's Guide to, to a Greater Boston. Uh, kind of walking tour history book of Boston from a progressive and left perspective. Seren wears many hats, as well as I mentioned, co-producer of the show. Thank you, Seren, for stepping into the guest role today. Hi, Joe. Thanks. I'm glad to be on the wrong side of the camera. I'd also want to note that uh, one of the co-authors of my book, uh, of our book, is uh, Joan Evans, and he's among the guests uh, on the show. 
Terrific. I see his name there. And Joe, we will definitely get you into this conversation uh, sooner or later. Uh, I hope you can stick around. For all of you who are on the live Zoom, we generally go about an hour with our guests and then open it up for question and answer and discussion. I know we have a number of experts on this topic today, and so I definitely want to make space for you all to share your views. Uh, so, but hopefully you can hang around. You can also write your questions in the chat box to make sure that the producers are aware uh, that you're ready to speak. So feel free to do that even earlier than, than later. Great, so what I've asked all of our guests to do to start is to give us about three to five minutes. First we'll go to Demita, then to Ross, and then back to Seren, just to kind of lay out your perspective on this moment that we've been living through, particularly as it pertains to the representation and the contestation of public space and pub public statuary, public memorials, public monuments, uh, and what at least uh, public art. Uh, I think, you know, we're going to talk today both about what needs to be or has been torn down as, what, as, as well as what should go up in its place or otherwise. But I'm just going to ask you to take a few minutes to just lay out your perspective. Uh, and, and we're really hoping to have a dialogue today between the speakers, not only me asking questions, but you corresponding with each other. So, Demita, please take it away. Wonderful. First of all, thank you again for inviting me. And I'm very excited, as I said to some of you earlier, the opportunity to talk about not only what's happening today with the insurrections that are taking place, very positive and wonderful refocusing and reframing of the conversation about what we want that represents us in a public sphere, that represents our higher selves, that represents what we consider beautiful and powerful in terms of justice. It's very exciting. So I'll just say from the beginning, I'm totally, completely in support of Black Lives Matter and what's happening with Movement for Black Lives and what's happening with the insurrection that's, um, that's occurring. It's long overdue, but as always, it's timely. And I say that as somebody who has been in this business of causing trouble for more than 50 years and realizing, someone said to me, uh, recently that um, did you expect things to have moved along further and I thought no actually we're fortunate we've gotten this far human change is slow so I'm as excited now as I was as a 16 year old who was in the streets of Chicago organizing against the war in Vietnam as a high school student so having said that I also want to say it is extremely exciting to see these Confederate statues and other implements of the settler co colonial project being torn down, removed, defaced, altered. They have never represented in, real, in any real way the real truths about this country, and in fact because they've been used as propaganda to reinforce um, anti-blackness and white supremacy, I'm thrilled to see them gone. One thing I want to say about um, public statuary and public art generally is I'm from Chicago, as many of you know, and Chicago is a city that I did not realize when I left it how um, amazing public statuary is in that city, and it's only increased in its variety, in its um, just amazing array in the, some 45 years since I've been away from it um, living there. And I was there a couple of years ago um, for the summer and spent the summer roaming the city. Chicago has some of the most amazing public art uh, on the south side of Chicago in the black community, things that had not been present when I was a young girl growing up there. And needless to say, it was fascinating to watch um, my young nieces, or excuse me, my grandnieces, with me as we're walking, looking in Bronzeville, in, on the south side, looking at um, – sort of these brick art installations of famous jazz musicians because Bronzeville in the city of Chicago was famous. Like uh, I would imagine, I guess we could make the closest thing we could say that's closest to it would be um, Harlem at the turn of the Harlem, at the 20th century. In any event, I grew up surrounded by all sorts of um, interesting public art and never really felt like I saw many Confederate pieces of art. I do know that they are in, I would suspect that there are some in Chicago, but it was never um, 
it just never left an impression. And there were plenty of statues to, um, to Cristobal, I'm sorry, Cristobal Colon, to Christopher Columbus, um, to famous Polish and other Eastern European sorts of, you know, heroes in various parts of Chicago and on the South side, which was predominantly African American when I was growing up, um, monuments to um, black leaders. <clears throat> so, I'd like to also say one of the other things about being in Chicago recently was seeing how much of the public art is being devoted to celebrating black women. Ida B. Wells, Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, it was wonderful. So it really contrasts incredibly to Boston, which is a city that has a lot of old art, but not a lot of new, exciting public art. Some, but not a lot, and certainly not enough devoted to, um, to um, social justice. So I'll stop there. I think I've had my four minutes, am I right? And just tell you that my fascination goes back many years. It's very useful, these public art pieces. What are we going to do going forward? That's my question. That's great. I think that's a great note to, to, to finish the opening on. I mean, one thing I want to flag that you just mentioned, I thought, first off, using the word propaganda, I think, is very useful there in terms of the, the historic functions of these, some of these dominant monuments, but also this question of who gets to be a hero, right? I think, you know, who gets to be lifted up right. as a hero and who decides that, which I mean, sometimes that might be one interesting way to crack open this question of, of, of public, what gets publicly, uh, mon, you know, memorialized in a way. So let's come back to that, but that's a great starter. I think Demita gives us a great question. How do we go forward from this moment? Uh, Ross, uh, you will get to that question soon enough, but how would you frame your relationship to this moment? What have you observed going on and, and what sense are you making of it from your own uh, scholarly and activist perspective? Uh, hey everyone. Um, so I guess I've been coming at this mostly um, through my work with a, an Italian American organization and just trying to work with our community and weigh our voices against our community's response to both the Black Lives Matter protests and the issue of the Christopher Columbus statues. Um, there have been some pretty negative reactions within our community. Um, a lot of people in the name of their Italian American identity, um, sort of taking a hostile position to the Black Lives Matter protests and also defending the Columbus statues. Even though there's been like remarkably like at least a dozen Columbus statues torn down in different communities with large Italian American populations, Still, the largest civic organizations within our community, like Knights of Columbus, Sons and Daughters of Italy, all of these kinds of civic organizations have been defending the, the statues. So the argument that we're trying to make, the challenge we're putting forward to our community is that, you know, this is an opportunity for us to sort of reinvestigate our own history as a community, because if you, if you really go back to the roots of our coming to this country and our early experience in this country, I think there's a lot more grounds for solidarity with Black Lives Matter and to think more critically about the Christopher Columbus statue, particularly the vast majority of Italian Americans in this country are of Southern Italian heritage. And one of the major reasons we fled that country is because of the very violent and racist oppression of peasant uprisings in the South of that country. And for us that still have family uh, living in, in the South of Italy, um, there are statues of the people who crushed those rebellions all throughout southern, southern Italy. Giuseppe Gar Garibaldi, there are so many uh, streets named after Vittorio Emanuele, um, all of these figures, the alleged, you know, fathers of the Italian nation state, who did so through sacking the south of Italy and annexing it into the new nation state. So then as we came to this country and had to assimilate to the new sort of uh, racial hierarchy that existed within the United States, which was different in subtle ways from the sort of racism that existed in Italy, there's a moment that, you know, historians have identified where our community leaders made a deliberate effort to sort of steer us, to steer our identity as a community towards um, white mainstream American culture. And um, with that, you know, we absorbed a lot of the racism and the classism that was part of this country. And I think we carry that baggage with us now. That's part of the reason I think we've reacted the way we have towards Black Lives Matter and the toppling of these Columbus statues. And, uh, you know, I, I, I want people to not feel like that through toppling 
these statues uh, that we should feel a sense of loss or we should feel it as an attack on Italian American heritage. Rather, it's an opportunity to think about why we chose this symbolic patron of our community in the first place and to return to those roots and to try to think of you know, what it means to be Italian American in a more dynamic and pluralistic kind of sense. So I'm uh, happy to expand on any of that later, but I, that's the gist of it. That's terrific, Ross. Uh, could you spotlight, I'm not sure if you said it, I didn't say it earlier, the name of that organization that you're working with? Oh, uh, it's, it's a, a magazine, like a, a literary magazine. and cultural publication. We're calling it uh, Pumaroa. Okay. okay, great. You maybe can share that in the chat box for those who are yeah. on live. Ross, I want to ask you one brief question before we go to Seren, which is just, I mean, I'm sure you could expand on this longer, but maybe the short form for now. How did Columbus become the signal figure that, that so much Italian American, at least public kind of uh, celebration is oriented around? Uh, I mean, obviously there would be many other figures to, to choose from, right? It's, um, and it's, maybe it's a big question. I don't mean to put you on the spot with it, uh, but uh, do you have a sense of that? Like, what does that history actually look yeah, like? Yeah, well, Columbus was already a symbol that was in circulation as Italian Americans were, what well, Italians were immigrating to this country and becoming American. And it, it had already sort of a sort of a symbolic currency to it. And so Italian Americans faced real racist violence when they came here. In fact, I think the largest lynching in American history was actually against Italian Americans. And I think that was in like, um, it was right around the turn of the century. I forget the exact year, but it was actually on the heels of that lynching that um, the, the president, I also forgot which president was in office at that particular time, inaugurated Columbus Day um, as a national holiday. Um, and Italian communities, particularly led by these civic organizations, the ones I mentioned before, started erecting statues of Columbus in Italian American neighborhoods as a sort of like symbolic defense against the people who are saying that these dirty immigrants contribute nothing to this country. Uh, well, you know, here's Columbus as a sort of revered mythological figure within the, you know, American, the American exceptionalism narrative. Yeah, no, it's powerful. I mean, I, I'm more familiar with the Irish, Amer Irish to Irish American trajectory, too, where you had a, in Ireland a real powerful tradition of abolitionism and a sense of solidarity. Frederick Douglass toured Ireland and had, you know, apparently rave, you know, rave support from the Irish nationalists who saw the analogy between British oppression in Ireland right, and, and African-American oppression in the United States. But then it's a very different story, right, among Irish Americans, at least dominant, dominant groups. I don't want to downplay the dissent that may emerge, but that book, How the Irish Became White, right, uh, really tells a story of how different Irish American identity developed versus, versus Irish identity when it came to define, you know, kind of claiming whiteness, as Ralph Ellison taught us, how do you, you know, how do you learn to, how did a European learn to be white? You learn the N-word. Right. I mean, it, it, is there certain truth captured there? So that's really fascinating. We'll get more into that, Ross, as we go. Seren, um, lay out your framework, and then maybe we can get a little crosstalk between the three of you. You know, both uh, Ross and Demita started out uh, by recognizing the, uh, the validity of the claims of the Black Lives Matter movement and essentially accepting the validity of the actions uh, against public symbols of white supremacy. I certainly find myself in that camp. At the same time, and, and here's where I want to, to risk uh, a, a concern that Franz Fainor raised, uh, that in a time of revolution, intellectuals in particular tend to want to focus on details rather than the movement itself. And so if I feel like if I were to introduce more fully my concerns about the attack on public art, I might fall into that trap of focusing on the details rather than the general nature of the movement. You see, right now it's possible for me to develop my list of monuments that need to come down, but it's also possible for the other side to develop their list. You know, they'll, they'll target Phyllis Wheatley, they'll go after Harriet Tubman, two beautiful monuments in Harriet Tubman, and, and these are like two beautiful monuments in Boston. Or, or as we saw in Rochester, New York, the, the theft and vandalism directed at the Frederick Douglass statue. So we could come up with two competing lists. And I think the way to, that we begin to move from two competing lists of what must go up and what must come down is to start to focus our conversations on the underlying social cleavages to remove the, to remove the sense of symmetry that they have a list and we have a list 
and instead look at the historical right and wrong of the situation. In other words, that in addition to targeting and challenging monuments, there needs to be a much richer conversation about the underlying social cleavages that define this contest. For me, that means focusing on racial capitalism, right? It means understanding the racial class and, and other sort of structures of power that, uh, that structure these systems. Moreover, it's really important to recognize that for the ruling class, the removal of a statue is something quite easy. In fact, capitalism is about the cycling and recycling of monuments, of buildings, of whole areas, of whole countries. So it's very easy for these things to go up and come down. You just need to look at building demolitions on YouTube to find a million you know, um, uh, videos of things going up and things coming down, coming down very fast and in spectacular ways. And so for me, the kind of political conversation that goes into this um, moment is really important. I'll give you one quick example, and you tell me if I'm going too long, Joe. Um, there was, uh, a, about two or three years ago, a, um, a Confederate a tombstone and monument marker was discovered on one of Boston's uh, islands. And it, it, it recognized Confederate soldiers who were interned on the island. As soon as that was noticed, within a few days, the, the governor of the state, right, a Republican libertarian, uh, decided that he would really quickly remove that uh, little marker and put it into the, into the state archives. So it was very easy for him to remove this object of public conversation and instead bury it in their history, ready to come out again whenever necessary. And that's what, I, what, what I'm so afraid of about any kind of unreflexive engagement with monuments. Um, I, I think that there's also another larger question. Once we start to focus on these monuments, for example, the area in which the Columbus statue came down in Boston or has been uh, uh, sort of where it was once vandalized and come down. Um, you know, when you think about that particular neighborhood in Boston, it's not exactly a place where the victims of Columbus and the system that he helped give birth to. Uh, it's not a place where those victims can actually rest, relax, and uh, engage one another. Instead, it's a, it's a place for the rarefied elites to gather and enjoy themselves. The playground for the rich, the not so famous, but the, uh, but the wealthy, certainly. And as such, a monument coming down in that neighborhood, making way for a, a more so-called woke monument really would not bring about the substantive change we need. So for me, the approach to this whole question is rather than thinking about the list that we need to bring down, right, to start to think about the underlying social issues that separate us and that require redress. Yeah, I think that's a great point as well, Seren. Uh, and I think it, the last note you ended on there, I think gives us all of our speakers today a chance to maybe weigh in, right? I mean, there is, I'll play a little devil's advocate, right? There's a kind of maybe vulgar political perspective that would say, you know, the symbolic action of taking down a monument really isn't real politics, right? Real politics would only be something like, you know, rent control or, right, decommodifying housing or whatever, you know, stopping police violence. And so this, this there's a way of thinking that would pit the symbolic against you know, as you say, the substantive. I don't think anyone that's on the show today is, is making that position, but I guess the question becomes, how, what are the different ways that the symbolic relates to the substantive? Maybe the ways that it relates already, oh. like, and, then, and then also the, maybe the ways that it could, the ways that it could or that it should, the different tendencies within the current conjuncture, the current movement that could and maybe are, right, clearly connecting the symbolic and the, and the substantial, the social, the structural political. Demita, you want to jump in on that? I really do, and I appreciate your perspective, Surin, because I really, um, I'm going to push back, but I really do appreciate your perspective because the notion that people get granular and think if I can do these performative, you know, leading of things, that somehow I've satisfied the anti-racist impulse. If I get rid of the Confederate, um, the monument to the Confederate soldiers held on, I think it was Grape Island, I can now have performed an anti-racist act. And that's, of course, 
typical of the cynical way in which we've approached dealing with race in this country. But I also want to push back a little bit because <clears throat> the thing about the Confederate monuments, um, especially I want to talk about Richmond, because it, it's not as if there's a context to the way in which African-American people have over the century and, and several years now since um, Jim Crow have looked at and seen the statue of Robert E. Lee. I forget what, you, what year it was erected. That's in Richmond. Um, it's a huge statue that was put there principally to terrorize and terrify black people by, by asserting the right of the lost cause. It's huge. It's, it sits in a place where you can't, you see it from everywhere. And so the antipathy toward it by the black community is long felt. It didn't just occur when folks from Black Lives Matter said, ooh, that statue should come down because it, it represents the Confederacy. So there's a history of black folk actively attempting to have a voice about the positioning, the place, the actual ex existence of that statue. That it is finally coming down now isn't just a function of now. It's a function of many years of pushback. And so in that way, I feel like when we talk about um, what we're going to do with some of the statuary, you're so right, sir, and I feel like we need to contextualize it and to, and to also recognize the ways in which the statuary is used as a symbol, is used as symbols, people don't typically interact up close. So when people talk about putting a plaque that explains, you know, the real history of a situation at the base of a statue or some accompanying piece of art that does a, a sort of different take on the historical moment that the original piece of work was made. I'm giving an example, for example, the statue of, the kneeling slave being protected by Lincoln that, you know, has gotten so much opprobrium here in Boston recently. And the idea was to have something accompanying it. That's not how people are, are necessarily consuming art, public art in that way. People don't always go and read the plaque. They're, they're seeing something large and it has, a, it's an image that conveys a message. So I, I actually say these things, which seem small, are oftentimes historically laden with meaning. And before we simply say, well, it's, it's not representative of anything to, to get rid of these things, I think we have to really, it, one by one, think about where they are, who put them there historically when they were placed, what was the intent, so that we don't underestimate the potency of some of these things. Yeah, that, that's great, Demita. I mean, I I would love to hear, you know, Ross and, and Seren's thoughts on this. I mean, I think one point that you make that's very clear is that although it might be theoretically possible to add things to existing monuments that would change the experience and, and, and negate some of their propaganda power, but you're saying a plaque won't do it, right? You know, with a lot of these things, right, that, that the nature of the bigness of some of these statues and the, the nature of the interaction needs to be engaged in a more kind of all a more encompassing way if there is the possibility of kind of, you know, reframing what used to be a celebratory monument so that it becomes a site of critical thinking and collective reckoning, right? So I just, I guess my, one of my questions here exactly. would, be, would be, what might be the ways? I mean, and I'm, I'm not opposed to tearing down some of these monuments. I've written about this, uh, I, the last time Columbus got blood tagged, as I call it, in Boston, I wrote an argument mm. uh, in Red mm. Light Magazine supporting that but also saying it might be good rather than tear Columbus down if we left him up blood tagged, you know, to provoke thought. Now, now that is the way I think you're going and I'm not even saying it's the way they should, but I guess one of my questions for Seren Ross and for Demeter would be, what are there models out there in the world or in the United States for how kind of reactionary historical monuments have been engaged in ways in addition to, I mean, tearing down is certainly one powerful option. And again, I'm not arguing against it, but I'm kind of curious, what are the range of uh, responses that we have to, to draw from in terms of how the reactionary history can be made, you know, kind of flipped into its opposite? Or is that just not really the way to approach these things? Uh, Demita, do you want to speak to that? And then we'll can I make up? Yeah. I actually make a quick point about it. I think something that Surin said, I would like to definitely um, piggyback on. Where we begin to make substantive, profound, committed change 
in the spheres of our lives that matter when we address oppression, in the end, the monuments, the public figures, the things that we choose at that point to begin to hold up as a society, as representative of our better angels, representatives of struggle that we've managed to somehow um, achieve either equity, parity, I, I don't even know what the word would be, the state of, of being would be for this white supremacist country. But if we continue to unearth and disempower white supremacy, some of the questions about what to do with monuments will become clearer because we'll have more minds involved in thinking about, is it really effective to get rid of it? Or do we want to have a year-long set of programs where we focus on the history as we've been taught it and the new history in our freedom schools that we're beginning to understand it? There's a lot of ways you can approach engaging with that art that don't have to be static. But I don't think we can really even have a substantive conversation about any of these things until we begin to really substantively address issues of institutional, systemic, anti-blackness, and white supremacy. Okay, so the sense that tearing these things down is really starting a conversation or reigniting a conversation that, that really has hardly even begun. It can. Yeah, okay, that's very That's right. Uh, Ross, I mean, I wonder if you'd like to speak to this. I, I mean, your embedded work with the Italian American community through this kind of agitation and education you're doing, I'm sure th this must have come up, right? I mean, the question of tearing down Columbus, the, the, the question of recontextualizing, um, do you have reflections on that that you'd like to bring to bear here or, or take us in another direction if you have a, a different thought? Well, I, I feel like uh, Columbus is a much easier figure to, to, uh, to speak to. It becomes more complicated with controversial figures of American history. But Columbus was such an arbitrary symbol for the Italian-American community in the first place. Uh, arguably, he wasn't Italian. He was alive centuries before Italy even like, came together as a political entity. Um, it'd be the equivalent of calling, you know, uh, someone from the Iberian Peninsula Iberian, to call someone from that same period from the Italian Peninsula Italian. It wasn't an identity that people had at that time. Also, he never set foot in the continental United States, and um, he, he didn't really accomplish anything of note in the first place. Um, so for us to adopt him as, you know, a, a, a patron symbol of our community is it's easy to attack on, on those merits alone, right? But to say whether or not, you know, somebody like Thomas Jefferson, a figure from American history who's a, compl a complicated figure, uh, whether or not statues of him should be recontextualized or torn down, I think it's far, sim uh, far, far more easy to say that Columbus should be torn down because there's really not much in favor of keeping his statues up. Yeah, okay, so there is a distinction here, even though, again, and I think Seren's opening comment is important, right, as we're playing this intellectual process here. I mean, I think it's important, but I mean, the idea that you're gonna micromanage the actions of masses of people up outraged about systemic racist police violence, like, you know, as, as a revolutionary once said, a revolution is not a tea party, right? Um, and, you know, and he didn't mean the Boston Tea Party, you know, he meant like a tea part, um, or the current tea party politically, but, you know, obviously, I'm not playing that game, but, but Ross, you are suggesting there are distinctions to be made too here, right? right? Distinctions to be made when we do reflect on these moments between the kind of arch representation of colonialism and racism that, is, that clearly is an offense to, you know, to, to all people who know this history and have humanity, especially those who are directly affected, and figures that are more, where there's a more mixed balance, right, of, of historical uh, kind of responsibility for things, you know, good and bad, if you will, for lack of a better term. So, yeah, I think that's, an, I mean, Seren, would you want to speak to that, uh, this question of, of I know you, you were pushing back on the idea that we should just have lists here, but Ross has put, you know, introduced the idea that there are distinctions to be made. I mean, you, you think a lot about these issues. I mean, how do you, how do you engage that, that question of the distinction between the, you know, the reactionary symbol that really needs to be torn down like a swastika and, and that which sh could be or should be a site for, for maybe, you know, for important critical reflection. You know, I, I should really clarify, though, I don't think that there's any daylight between um, Demeter's position and my position in terms of what must come down. What, what, you know, the process she describes in Richmond of long community resistance, much like there was long community resistance in Minnesota, 
to that statue of Columbus that came down, and in fact, and the fact that the American Indian movement led uh, American Indian movement led that uh, destruction was was really important because it did not foreclose on any kind of public conversation. Th that kind of process, in contrast to say the uh, the way the um, uh, governor of Massachusetts removed uh, a Confederate park, um, is um, is what I, I'm interested in sort of uh, pulling out and bringing to the fore, right? The distinction between a, a mass-based community kind of effort versus an elite reform, which co-opts a movement by quickly uh, bringing down a monument. At the same time, I think that there are creative ways of um, of dealing with reactionary structures. I'll give you one example, one positive example from Massachusetts, right? In, and we, we write about this in A People's Guide to Greater Boston. On Coles Hill in Plymouth, right, there's a huge statue of Massasoit, you know, facing eastward, bold and defiant, right? Massasoit, uh, you know, represented the Wampanoag Nation and uh, was, a, of course, one of the figures who at first welcomed the pilgrims before, uh, you know, falling afoul of the pilgrims. Um, that statue is on top of a hill that contains a graveyard of the pilgrims, right? And so you, you have this uh, very uneasy juxtaposition of two sites, uh, you know, uh, with, with the construction of the statue. Now the statue doesn't come about because some people, you know, out of the goodness of their heart, wanted to represent indigenous people. Instead, the American Indian movement, as well as local Wampanoag leaders, uh, staged a counteraction in 1970 to the official celebration of uh, Thanksgiving Day, right? And, and that was where we have a rechristening of Thanksgiving Day as a day of mourning, right? And ever since that year, without interruption, right, people have gathered at Coles Hill to mark the day of mourning while the rest of the United States celebrates Thanksgiving. So yeah, as an example of a real community process to challenge the dominant representation while building community at the site in sometimes frigid temperatures on Thanksgiving Day. So, so that for me is a more interesting process. It's also a more interesting process because this year, 2020 is the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the pilgrims. So this year's day of mourning is going to be a particularly important one. And so, you know, people interested in this topic should really connect with Native American groups who are going to be organizing for, or are already organizing to, to mark this year's day of mourning. So, so that, that's how I would contrast these processes. One, they could be a surreptitious action taken at night to bring down a monument versus a long community-based process to either take down a monument or speak to other monuments in different and creative ways. Yeah, that's very powerful, Saren. Uh, I mean, a couple of things I, I'd like to lift up from what you said and, and, and also give others, uh, invite others to speak to them, is the idea of thinking about these monuments um, both the, the taking down and the rising, raising up as, as a matter of process. It's not just about the product uh, that is created, the fixture, but about the process, how much a community is involved in that process, right? Uh, I mean, I think Demita was also suggesting earlier the importance of drawing more people into these discussions, not only about monuments, but about the issues and the history and the political uh, power, you know, issues that they represent or fail to. Um, and this, this, this importance of evaluating these things, not only as fixed structures, but as kind of living processes. I know uh, I learned recently from a, an indigenous historian here at UMass Boston, an anthropologist, that we have, uh, uh, you know, history right, in, right outside on Dorchester Bay on Deer Island, which served as an internment site for Native Americans during the King Philip's War, right? Something I, I believe you write about in your book as well. Uh, on the mainland anyway, I mean, I think there's a little something on the island now after a long fight, but there's still very little. People who walk, you know, walk the, uh, the coast of Dorchester Bay may look out and they see Deer Island is now the waste processing center for Greater Boston. The famous kind of white milk jug looking, you know, tower is here, one of which has a big American flag on it. But nobody looking out on that would actually see, right, uh, you know, from the coast, 
uh, any monument to my knowledge of what had happened there. I think it was also Irish internment uh, during a during some plague years. The Irish immigrants were kept out there, and all, many of them died and, and were buried in mass graves. I guess my point is here that there is most of the native efforts to kind of reclaim that site have emphasized ceremony, right? And they do an annual great paddle to recreate the path by which natives were displaced and forced to a forced kind of death march from Natick, one of the praying Indian towns in uh, just west of the city to come all the way out to um, where they were deposited on Deer Island where many of them were left to die. But the emphasis on that memorial hasn't been necessarily building a big statue Right, but the enactment of a of a kind of solidarity r memorial that happens right around the Thanksgiving holiday, if I'm not incorrect, as well. So it also raises the question of form, right? Not only the content of of memorials, but the very idea we have in our head about what does it mean to memorialize. I wonder if Ross or Demita would like to speak to that. Saran, I think you are ready to too. I mean, where did we get this idea of? just, you know, monuments, just big, you know, granite statues to important, usually men, right? Often armed, you know, patriarchal war figures. Uh, and is that the only way to think about how we memorialize history? I mean, even if, even, you know, if we change the gender or the race of the representation so that it's more inclusive, is, is big statues to powerful people, you know, the only way to think about monuments? Or are there some other ways to even think about the form of these uh, memorials in, in in fresh ways. I don't know. <laughs> I'll pass yeah? it to Saran and Demita. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a big one. I know Saran had some thoughts on this, thinking about international examples and uh, dif different ways that memorial, memo you know, monuments are being erected around the world as we speak, um, negative as well as positive examples. I mean, Demita, let me ask you this. Uh, you mentioned Chicago is having a much more robust sense of social history and justice and creativity in public art and public memorialization, as opposed to Boston. Um, what's missing here in Boston? What would you like to see uh, in terms of representation in the form of public art or uh, public memorialization? You know, what's missing from the Boston uh, landscape that you would like to, to see restored or, or uh, drawn out in a, in, a more, in a more powerful way? I think you may be muted. Am I muted? You, all right, you're back. I'm, I, okay, now I'm on. I was muted before. I had no idea. Let me say a couple of things, and I, I probably won't respond to your question about what's needed, because I think the process of figuring out what we want representing um, art, our power, our sense of um, freedom from oppression, these are conversations I think that have to take place amongst people in communities. These are conversations that will take place in Nubian Square and in Chelsea and in places where people are collected together in ways that they have an opportunity to say, what I want to look at on, when I'm on the bus day in, day out, when I'm walking my dog, I, do, I want to see the following as representation of the best of who we are. I don't want anyone to respond to that. I actually want to say something else, though. Statuary, I mean, I'm not an art historian, but statuary and the representation of the human form and all of that, we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of years of human history, right? And it's not always the people who are... Um, the military heroes who are represented because it depends on which culture in the world you're talking about. So it's too big a subject for me anyway to talk about. But what I can say is that I think you're so right about the idea of understanding that the memorialization of the overcoming of oppression can be ritual. The acknowledgement, like, like, again, like the paddle out from, you know, from the mainland out to the island to commemorate that situation. So there are ways in which we can do um, many ways of memorializing. But I think the thing that I'm very fascinated by is all everything about our culture in the United States is very much local and segregated. So art coming art. We, there's a lot of art representation that's been true about the south side of Chicago because black folks have lived there since the beginning of the Great Migration. Um, so we're talking about the 1890s forward. Um, 
black sculptors and black art and muralists, wonderful. And it's, it's great that we have that art there. We also have in the black community statuary that, that um, celebrates like, you know, Lafayette and all these great white men. There are not, there are, there's, no, there's no turnabout in fair play. In Rogers Park and in Edgewater on the north side of Chicago, there are no statues to Ida B. Wells. There are no statues that are up for Gwendolyn, for Gwendolyn Brooks. So we have a one-way propaganda campaign that continues because it perpetuates the isolation and the segregation of powerful figures. So <clears throat> in any event, I'm interested in the conversation about how we create insurrectionist art that triggers people thinking in their communities about some of the dominant issues that we have to deal with in this country. For example, amazing youth, um, new representations that really look at the history of slavery in the North. We could have a wonderful mural like that um, on the North side of Chicago, and it would be seen by people who are predominantly not all white, because Chicago's changed a lot, but it would be cited in a place where people who are from that community would have to deal with and look at part of the history that they typically can ignore because they don't have to see it in the community they live in. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's great. I mean, I, I, that's uh, so rich. I mean, I think the very idea you just put forth of insurrectionary art that triggers critical thinking, right? Critical thought about these crucial issues. Yes. And, and I think it, it implicitly contrasts very, you know, profoundly with what we usually get. I mean, again, I know I'm painting with a broad brush, but from a lot of the official monuments, they, they hardly seem oriented towards critical thought. It's more like about how to put thought to sleep, right? You know, and maybe in, in make, make people feel, feel a feeling of pride for nation or something, right? A certain kind of nation, a certain- Adoration. Kind, right, but not-, but not Adoration. Thought. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's profound. And again, the emphasis on process. I appreciate your reluctance to just give the list of what should go up and your emphasis on the need for real community-based process that would really make uh, what you know the, the changes representative of what people really want and what people feel like they need, uh, which sounds again absolutely a profound shift, and it really does connect the uh, the symbolic to the the political, right? Because you're building community voice. Um, so Iraq exactly. Ross, I mean Ross, I mean I know you you're wearing multiple hats today and in general as well as an Iraq War veteran who's also written about your experience and not only your experience but others' experience the people's experience in Fallujah, right? I mean, you must have an acute sense of the way, the reality of war, U.S. war, aggression, you know, uh, and, and the way that gets represented at home, not only home in the United States, as well as perhaps in Iraq, uh, in other places the U.S. has invaded. I mean, do you have some thoughts on the way that war tends to get represented here in the United States. I mean, I don't want to, we're not, I, I want to make it clear, I'm not trying to derail from the Black Lives Matter focus of the moment, but one of the questions I've had in my head is, will this Black Lives Matter uh, trajectory also can increasingly grow to include the global non-white, the global Black lives that have been so devastated by U.S. imperialism abroad? And, and what would that mean for the way that memorializations of war and soldiery occur in the United States. So, I mean, in my, in my view, there is a link there, even though it may not be what's on the front pages. Ross, do you have some thoughts? I'm sure you have thoughts. Would you share some of your thoughts on, on this question, yeah. how war gets represented? Yeah, uh, I mean, I have scattered thoughts. You know, I'll uh, share a few of them. I mean, obviously, the majority of the war monuments in this country are sort of triumphalist and celebratory in nature. The vast majority of them are erected because veteran organizations at either the local or the state level have lobbied to have their experience given permanence and or visibility in some way. Um, the most, probably the most well-known war memorial, I think, is the Vietnam Memorial. And uh, I forget the name of the artist who designed that memorial, but she was specifically trying not to make a triumphalistic or celebratory monument and instead just listed the names of all the American dead. And obviously the huge glaring emission uh, omission in, in that design is Vietnamese people, of course. Um, and I know there's, I, I'm kind of jumping a little bit because I know there is some debate about, you know, creating an Iraq war memorial. And I actually think we might be better without one because my fear is that 
there's a huge representational challenge of trying to depict in some way like the enormous scope of this suffering that we caused the Iraqi people. I have no clue how that would be done, but my fear is that by trying to represent that in some way, in some sort of like permanent, you know, uh, image, it, 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 it could give, a, a, it could communicate a sense of finality in the sense that like, okay, we've thought about this, we've memorialized it, now we don't need to think about it anymore. Um, that's my concern because there's just so much to, that we still don't know about what we've done to Iraq. Uh, I think we have decades ahead of us of trying to come to grips and trying to understand what was done. So a statue at, at this point, I think is probably more dangerous than not. These are scattered reflections. I'm sorry for the lack of coherence between, <laughs> between us. No, I, I think it's, it's powerful. I mean, I always think when I teach this stuff with my students, I think, you know, you look at the size of the Vietnam, Vietnam war, uh, war the, the, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., right? And you think that that wall, and then, and then you do the math, how many, you know, Vietnamese were killed in that war, and how, how long would that wall have to be, right? It would be like a coil going around, you know, the, the, that, that monument near yeah. the mall for, you know, for, I don't know, it would probably be a mile long. Um, so because that monument wasn't celebratory, it caught an incredible amount of flack. Right. It was a very controversial monument. Yeah. And of course, now we've been living through an attempt to precisely reverse that trend, right? As we are in the 50th, I think we are still within the, the, the kind of protracted 50 year history of the Vietnam War. And there's been a U.S. government effort to try to kind of do with Vietnam what was done has been done with uh, maybe easier in a more, there's an easier case to make for World War II nonetheless. Right, and a kind of a kind of whitewashing of the Vietnam War that's ongoing as we speak, uh, and people can look that up. But there are websites now devoted to trying to kind of put a more patriotic spin on the Vietnam War, uh, which is just you know turns my stomach, and I hope I'm not alone on that front. Um, Seren, uh, I'd like to go back to you because I know as someone who's helped to co-author a book about people's history in the in Boston specifically. You must have, even though I think I'm sure you would agree with Demita's point about collective process, in fact, you already have, you must have also some ideas about various sites that either are being memorialized already, perhaps in problematic ways that, we, that aren't on the, the, the radar yet in the way that, that Confederacy monuments are, and also un, unrepresented people's history, uh, or at least that is unofficially represented, in, and what, might, what opportunities that might, that might create looking forward. Thanks, Joe. Uh, you know, in order to address this, I would like to um, do two things, right? I, I think it would be good to, to turn in a few minutes to the collective wisdom of the group gathered here and, and reach out to them. And I don't mind calling on them too. Uh, since Absolutely. I, I know we have a couple of okay, public art and historian yes, experts okay. on this call. Absolutely. Right. Um, I, I think that there have been some really interesting models based on precisely what you've described at Deer Island. Uh, about a year ago, I attended an event organized by an American, a number of a coalition of American Indian groups, which, uh, which had a participatory activity to it, which involved uh, showing how Deer Island, its topography and size changed over time as various uses came to be um, applied to the island. Part of that sort of ecological history of the island and topographical history of the island, you know, showed us the changing regimes from indigenous management of the land, as it were, through the colonial period, through the industrial period, right? And so there is a broader conversation happening than any small monument may actually uh, convey on the island. So because there's this broad indigenous mobilization with these participatory activities. Unfortunately, these things don't receive a huge amount of funding. And so the kind of uh, national conversation that needs to happen about places like Deer Island and the Deer Islands around the United States, that kind of conversation isn't happening at a sufficient scale. Right, but it's important to recognize the Native American efforts to um, to understand uh, Deer Island and to explain its meaning to us. Among the aspects of that presentation, for example, 
is how we are to understand climate change and its impact, right? Now, if you think about Deer Island itself, it has these huge egg-shaped digesters for the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, right? And these process the waste for the entire city of Boston and a number of surrounding cities. It's the second largest facility of its type in the country. Any monument that has to be built there that would in any way um, pose a counterpoint to those digesters would have to be truly huge in size. But there's another issue in the very architecture, in the concrete of that site that we have to understand. Those digesters were built in 1985 at the cost of billions of dollars, which residents of Boston are still paying for today through a bond that was taken out to clean up the Boston Harbor. Now, what has that got to do with our conversations about race and class and gender? Well, yes, what it has to do with it. As a result of the people of Boston paying for that, for the, for that facility, right? Water, rate, water rates in Boston are among the highest in the country. And 10 times more likely, black Boston will be shut off from water than white Boston. You, and so you see that in that structure, in that monument, that functional monument, right, in, on the on Deer Island right now, you find our racial landscape being defined. So for me, you know, that's why we really have to connect the issues of um, of the symbolism with the underlying social cleavages, right? Um, having said that, I do believe that with among those Native American groups trying to develop that site, there is an answer there that appear, that applies to the rest of us by 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 working with the community-based structures and programs and participatory activities that they have defined. We will begin to treat and engage with these monuments more realistically. Of course, for the bigger question that I raised around the uh, around the disparate water shutoff rate. A big social movement needs to emerge around that. If Black Lives Matter, surely the water that people across the city also matter, right? And and given the disparate shutoff rates, we we know that this is one of the ways in which the system tries to diminish Black lives, right? Um, I, I would also say that across the city of Boston, you have a number of positive examples. Certainly, the life-size portrayal of Phyllis Wheatley on um, Commonwealth Ave is an example of a more democratic form of art. Similarly, uh, so is the case with the Harriet Tubman statue in the South End. Uh, having said that, you know, we, we have to be able to evaluate the city of Boston in terms of its investment in art across, in public art across the city. To what extent are the kinds of activities that the Native American groups that I just described, to what extent are those activities being funded and supported, not only by the city itself, but by our movements, right? So, so I, I, I'd say that to the extent that we're conducting campaigns, we need to be able to integrate these arts into those campaigns. So, so that would be my fairly long answer, I'm afraid, to your, to, your, um, to your question and the points made earlier. But before you explain my point to, you know, for the benefit of others, um, why don't we turn to the audience? Are there any questions that have come in? Yeah, uh, we have a couple who people have indicated that they'd like to speak. I don't have their full question here, but I'm sure I knowing the people who are on, we have uh, people who can explain them quite well. Uh, Mark Soderstrom is on the line. Mark has been on a couple of our shows here and he's back again today on a topic he knows a lot about. Mark, uh, please, please offer some thoughts. Hey, I will, I'm, I'm trying to think about how to frame this as a question and I might not succeed. It might be a comment that sort of seeks to think about linking Confederate monuments and Columbus monuments in a particular way. Um, thinking about the fact that memorials are not history. Commem you know, commemoration is not critical history. It's a, it's a public act that happens at the time of the erection of the monument. And when we look at monuments like the Confederate monuments, particularly the Lee monument, which in part was used to break a biracial workers movement that had taken control of the Richmond City Council. Um, right. These movements are, that movement is specific to the late 19th century and the early 20th century. Nobody's putting up Confederate monuments in the 1870s right after the war. 
They're putting them up at the time when we're establishing a new sort of unified North-South white nationalism. Um, and the role of the Confederate mm -hmm. monuments is to whiten the U.S. by, by showing the performance of racial domination. Um, and I think there's a parallel with Columbus, and I'd be interested in Ross's response. But when I signed on today, I noticed that the photo of uh, Columbus that was used in the email uh, looks to me to be the Syracuse uh, Columbus statue here in Syracuse, New York, about two miles from me, with Syracuse, with Columbus standing on four disembodied Plains Indian heads, Dakota in full war bonnet. Um, and if that's not bad enough, at the bottom of the statue are panels that have, the final panel is Columbus standing in front of the queen with prostrate Dakota chiefs in full war bonnet uh, lying on the ground in front of the queen as Columbus displays them. Um, and again, here the whiteness machine oh. that is operating, this was erected by the citizens of Italian descent in Onondaga County, the whiteness machine that is operating whitens Italians by performing racial domination. Um, and I think that is sort of critical to understand in what these monuments were meant to do. The racism in these monuments, as my friends in computers say, is a feature, not a bug. It's not a mistake that there's racism right. in these monuments. It is part of what the monuments were intended for. And so when I see Jeff Davis on the ground, it just makes me happy, right? You know, um, I, <laughs> and I could watch that Ed Colston, you know, Edward Colston coming down in Bristol, you know, founder of the Royal African Company. I could watch that video over and over again as he's thrown into the drink. Um, Bill's a person, right? right? Um, but I wonder, you know, and, and particularly with the Columbus statue, these are Plains Dakota Indians from the continental United States, not Arawak or Taino people, the people Columbus actually encountered. And I think that just makes the whole right. racial domination and whiteness, whitening of it in a U.S. context so evident. Because Arawak and Taino are meaningless in 1932, but everybody knows what a Dakota chief looks like, right? Um, so yeah. I'm wondering... I just want to think about that link and how that kind of link to the use of race as an important mon memory meaning making device might function in other contexts as well. And I'm sorry I went on far too long, Joe, but this is an exciting topic to me. Oh, I don't think you went on too long at all, Mark. I, I, I'm sure you can say more. Maybe you'll come back into the conversation in a bit. Would anyone like to, would our speakers like to respond to Mark's point? I, a key point about intentionality and about the real, the later reconstruction of these monuments with, you know, which were themselves political interventions aimed at kind of marginalizing, splitting off various kinds of alternatives. Uh, Demita, would you like to speak to that? Well, it's just, there's something ironic. I just think about Columbus all the time, and, and what Mark was saying about the whitening aspects of this and the uses of taking um, people to represent um, yet another aspect, yet another slice of humanity as white. It's ironic to me that Italians who were so vilified when they came to this country by the WASP hegemony, I mean, it's just ironic to me. Well, I mean, it's just, it's, it's truly ironic of all the things that could have happened to have someone who was part of a vilified group suddenly taken over and, and held up in the way that we've mythologized him. So I also want to say something else that Mark said that was really interesting to me was just noticing we have a visceral reaction when the statues of these um, people who we either recently discovered or had always known were evildoers, but, you know, what can you say about them? I'm fascinated by something that Surin said earlier about the sort of tit for tat. If you tear down my monument, then I can get to tear down one of yours. And the truth of the matter is, that also belies the real nature of the way monument destruction has taken place in this country. When you look at the Emmett Till Memorial that has been shot, had to be recreated three times, shot up in Mississippi with bullet holes, intending again, this is post-1950, um, actually the memorial went up I think in the 70s, or maybe the first one went up in the 60s, 
that was all predicated on terrorizing black people. I don't think black folks at the same time were going around and shooting up Confederate monuments. So context matters and the way the history unfolds in terms of whose monuments are allowed to stand and whose monuments are not. So it's um, the fake notion of the, I mean, not, the notion that these things are equal, that people keep trying, not certain, of course, but that's promulgated now. If we take down this, we've got to take down George Washington. Maybe we should. Because the whole notion of how we think about our so-called founding fathers and the mythologizing that goes on around their lives all of that is up for grabs as far as I'm concerned. And we need to be inquiring, why are we not showing the true complexity of our so-called heroes? Because then are we going to have to question, are they heroes? The founding fathers, really? They sound like an abusive group of people, given how many of them are slaveholders. So you get my drift. Yeah, I think, I think we do. Uh, and it's a good drift to, to get. Uh, Ross or Seren, did you want to speak to Mark's uh, thoughts on this uh, before we take a couple more questions or comments? Seren, you want to go first? Or? Sure, I'll, I'll have, a, have a brief point in response to, to Mark. I, I also want to say that uh, by mentioning two lists, I was rejecting a symmetry between their lists and our list. And, and I said that the way we understand yes. these different lists is by focusing on the cleavages, the historic rights and wrongs, the people who are suppressed versus the people who wish to oppress others. So we have to maintain that there is no symmetry between their list and our list. And we also have to maintain that there is a their and an ours. You know, there are differences, irreconcilable differences between us and them, right? Who the us is, it's something right. to define. And that reminds me about Mark's point. So that photo that you referred to of the Columbus statue, I took it on Saturday, July 4th at a demonstration against uh, sort of the celebration of July 4th, organized by one of the Black Lives Matters groups here in Syracuse, New York. And uh, when, when thinking about that statue, there were people from the Onondaga Nation talking about it. And, and Italian American came to speak after them. Uh, people who were, uh, and his grandparents had fled Mussolini in the 1920s. Uh, so they had fled fascism. Now, there's, there's a lot to unpack there, right? In 1936, when that statue went up to uh, Columbus, right, Mussolini was engaged in invading Ethiopia, the second Italian uh, Abyssinian War, right? Mm -hmm. And so there was a global right. consciousness of Italian nationalism merged with uh, Italian imperialism, merged with a global anti-Africanism. And so that dimension has to be understood and, and, and unpacked, right? We must remember that at this point, Mussolini had been in power for 10 years. One of the ironies of celebrating Columbus at that point is that in those years, 1936, Mussolini was also sending troops to suppress the Spanish Republic, you know, in particular, right. Right, Barcelona and, uh, and Madrid, which, uh, which is, uh, and of course, in Barcelona is where um, Columbus uh, sort of got his uh, patronage structures from, right? Um, so we have to be able right. to unpack all of these the dimensions. So when we think about the global debate right now, and we think about Black Lives Matter and the global scale of it, give, given that the Roads Must Fall monument uh, movement is what inspired a lot of what we see today, right? Um, we, uh, we, we, yes. we look at the internationalism, the underlying principles that would inform that internationalism. How is it that our different uh, communities can relate to one another? One of them would be the kind of anti-fascism that, uh, that existed among Italians in the 1930s as they stood up, you know, against the, the part, uh, against the, um, the, the fascists ruling their country. And as some of them participated, you know, in the international brigades in Spain. And so th that's the kind of internationalism I feel is missing from some of our conversations. I don't see it as a peculiar responsibility of Black Lives Matter to, uh, to engage with the global, because I think that one, they are engaging with the global, but that's a broader responsibility of all of us to, to engage with the global dimensions to all of this. And there's no more appropriate moment right. than a moment of global pandemic to think globally, 
So th that's all I have to say about this, this matter. Ross? Ah, wonderful. Seren hit all the important points. Um, the only other thing I think I can add at this point is uh, in the Italian language, um, razza, race, it can also be synonymous for family. So, you know, around the 1860s, in the period where Italy allegedly uh, united and became a country, before there, there was a fully articulated Italian national sort of identity, um, there, was, there were really, there were much more complicated racial categories in Italy. So, you know, Greeks, Turks, Italians, Spanish would have been thought of as distinct races of people, uh, regardless of color. And something coming from the, the scholarship on the Italian American immigrant experience is that in the United States, we have this really particular binary um, ideology of color where there was white and there was black and race was fit into these uh, color categories. And that was something that Italian uh, immigrants had to adapt to when they came to this country. And it was around the same time as Rin pointed out that all of these other ideologies, Italian national identity, as Italy was coming uh, more and more deeply invested in African colonization, that um, uh, Italian American immigrants were coming in contact with these new racial ideologies. And the Italian American civic organizations that I mentioned earlier made this deliberate effort to steer our community's identity um, in the direction of these uh, ideologies for the sake of self-defense. And it's the, the great irony that the Mita was pointing out to escape uh, the racial uh, violence that we were experiencing, <laughs> we erected statues of a, of a genocidal madman. Um, it, it's deeply ironic, right. it's... but there's a story behind it. You know? Yeah. So, it's so American. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so much on the table right now. Uh, we had a question that came in, and Mark, we may go back to you in a bit. I know you have a lot on, to share on this topic. Uh, Joe Nevins, who is on the call, Seren's co-author, but apparently has no working microphone, so he has written me a question, which I'm going to pitch to at least uh, Demita and Seren. Uh, I'm gonna, just going to excerpt a bit of it. Uh, first of all, thanks you all for the, these great insights. And given, given your individual and collective criticisms of, of how many monuments have come about and your ideas about what is to be memorialized and how, how that should come about, I, he's wondering, Joe is wondering, if you have any thoughts on the Martin Luther King Memorial that is planned for the Boston Common. Uh, does, and if, if so, how uh, the would-be memorial, uh, how does it fall on the, uh, the, on the problematic processes that concern you? Uh, or does it challenge those problematic processes? Uh, do you see any opportunities that this memorial building process in particular offers for engaging in the deep, broad, critical engagement uh, that you have been advocating for? So what about the Mar MLK? I mean, some people may not know, but Martin Luther King has a long history in Boston as well as many other places. Uh, and there's, a, there's been a memorial attempt. Uh, you know, there is a memorial planning to go up for him. Uh, Saran or Demita, or perhaps Ross, do you have some thoughts on this particular example? Now, this is Demita, and I'll just say, I saw the, the prototype, the sketches of it. Um, I didn't, you know, again, as someone who likes to consume art, I didn't have a strong reaction to it, but I understood it. Given the iconography of it, I really understood it, and so I thought, I think, is it going to be on the Boston Common? I thought it was going to be closer to BU, but regardless. I think the thing that's really interesting to me is, again, so many, the choices of who to memorialize, and I understand absolutely that we're talking about a man who had an extraordinary presence in Boston as a young man, and so did Malcolm X. So, and so did a number of other people who were very instrumental and had lives that really affected the broader culture and the world, in fact. So I was more interested in why we are... Why, again, the choices that we make and why. I think that's the thing. I, I wouldn't want to criticize Memorial as being one thing or another. I'm just always curious as glad that it was for Martin Luther King, for Dr. King. There are so many people who contributed so much to the civil rights movement. Where's our monument of unknown warriors? Where is the monument to the unknown? 
counted countless who made the movement possible. So um, that's my take on it. You know, Demita, I, I sort of had a similar reaction, perhaps uh, less subtle than yours, in a sense that uh, I, I wonder about the process by which the monument came about, the people who put up a million dollars to, to fund uh, the concept and the design and conduct a conversation about it. Uh, you know, uh, and it didn't really seem to me to come uh, directly from uh, organizations or uh, co people in the communities of Boston where, where either Martin Luther King would have lived or people he would have marched with. And so Boston is so, uh, you know, uh, to put a, make the point a bit differently, in, ad in, ad in addition to the countless uncounted, um, there are also people like yourself, you know, and others who can be counted and who have contributed to our history in such profound ways. Uh, and, and so I wonder about a more democratic approach to celebrating the struggles of people. You know, we, we can go back to Sarah Ramon Parker, who helped um, you know, an abolitionist, an African-American woman, who, who helped the right. U.S in the, um, the Civil War by working in England with um, a number of other people to prevent uh, English intervention on the side of the South in the, in the Civil War. Right. So you know, why don't right. we have uh, you know, more um, structures recognizing these kinds of efforts? Certainly in Salem, there, are, uh, there is a park uh, to the Ramon family. Um, but I, uh, I, I think there, there needs to be a much more broad-based kind of celebration of not only African Americans, but all sorts of working people within the uh, greater Boston area. Um, if you'll forgive me going on just a little bit longer, one person whom we did not get to write about in the book was the journalist William Worthy. Um, I'll say his name oh. William Worthy. And we, we considered writing about him, and in the end, it didn't quite make the cut. But William Worthy was an eyewitness to revolution. He wrote about the um, Chinese Revolution firsthand. He wrote about the Cuban Revolution firsthand. And he also wrote about the Iranian Revolution firsthand. And it wasn't a passive matter of writing, because for each of those encounters, he incurred the wrath of the State Department, losing his passport, being mm. subject to pr prosecution. So yeah, was a persecuted mm. great Bostonian who could be witness to world revolution, while at the same time, in the 1970s, keeping an, uh, an eye on what was happening to the multiracial working class communities of Boston, which existed for a time. And for, for example, he wrote a book in the 1970s called The Rape of Our Neighborhoods, speaking about the expansion mm -hmm. of the large nonprofits, the hospitals, the corporation into these different communities. So yeah, it was a criticism of the gentrification of the city long before that language entered our daily vocabulary. So, so I think that there are people like William Worthy if you'll forgive a pun, you know, worthy of recognition uh, uh, for, uh, for our time. And so in response to Joe's question, and we've discussed this King uh, Memorial, this is not to take away from Dr. King and Coretta Scott King. By the way, the, the monument that's intended is to celebrate the relationship between King, uh, Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King. I don't know if it will give us... Right of the intellectual chemistry between them in that Coretta Scott King introduced Martin Luther King to democratic socialism and challenged um, Martin Luther King, uh, you know, about capitalism and that kind of thing. Will that monument provide that kind of nuance, right? I doubt it. And so right. I think that we right. have to look more carefully at these monuments and what are being, uh, what, the kinds of things that are being funded. That said, I don't want to take away from that monument. Right. Right. Yes, so much here. Um, you know, I, I think you know, Demita's <laughs> point about representing the unrepresentable or the unrepresented, I mean, uh, is a powerful point. And, and Seren's focus on 
locating specific potentially heroic or exemplary or illuminating figures and that have been lost uh, or not represented and, and claiming reclaiming them is both powerful perspectives to meet on in terms of the representing the unrepresented i mean i, I was i was reminded as you were speaking of brian stevenson's uh or at least yes. one of the, you know the, the the monument to to lynching i believe it's located in alabama i have not yes. to see it but one thing that struck me about the images i've seen of that i don't know if we can get an image we can get a link to that in the chat box for people but is the powerful connection between a localized site that tries to commemorate all the known lynchings but then also site specific interventions right that have a similar aesthetic at the actual sites where these lynchings took place across the south so you have this kind of linking right. of a hub and a spoke kind of like linking specific locations to a a bigger symbolism and it just connected in my view to Saran's idea about internationalism what would it mean to have memorials that actually drew attention to connections between places right that weren't just one-offs you know uh, that had a more network that's, that's I'm just kind of thinking out loud but it, it i know that that particular i mean stevenson's work is very inspiring to me and i think that memorial seems incredibly profound uh, just as one example well, two, um, of more recent memorialization, I don't know if we could share perhaps some other examples that seem to inspire or that are examples to be critiqued. I know we have a, a rare, uh, rare set of voices here today to share. Uh, I would really like to just, can I just add one thing? Yeah, and I think that's yeah, brilliant. Yeah, Steven, I, I, Br Brian Stevenson is a hero of mine, so I, I just think he's brilliant. And I think what he's done with that memorial and the artists who executed it are just brilliant. One thing that I think is interesting is that back in a long time ago, when Convahee was still extant, we talked about the connections, and this is way before the Internet, of course. We're talking about the 1970s and the, and the early 80s. Um, we were in contact with black women worldwide. The, Shea the Seychelles Islands. I mean, to make a map of where we made connections with black women around the world and have that be a, a memorialization of the reach of black feminisms um, over the last 50 years. So, yes, there's a lot of ways we could do representation of that very thing that you're talking about. And I love, by the way, Soren, thank you so much for highlighting and raising up the important role that Coretta Scott King played in Martin Luther King's intellectual and um, philosophical evolution. So I think, you know, we, again, there are so many extant artists. There are so many people who are thinking about this um, work right now. I'm very excited about what I'm seeing with so many young people who are using their talents as plastic artists, as written word artists, to project themselves outward and using all the means with which they can to create memorials. Now that we have the internet, we can memorialize many things that aren't even, that seem etheric and evanescent, but that are in fact lasting forever. So I think memorialization, which has always been something that's been part of, you know, what's written and what's created in terms of, um, in the physical realm, I think we're now being, you know, we have a chance to really begin to do memorialization that relates to the etheric era that we live in. And I want to say one final thing about Boston. One of the things that, about the public statuary in Boston that is so interesting to me is that it's a bit staid. Boston doesn't have an electricity to it in terms of its um, public art sort of gestalt. And I've been to many cities around this country, and I hope, Cern, you get to comment about South Africa before, the, before we end in terms of what public art is looking like there. But I, I feel like Boston could use some re, sort of resetting and reinvigoration. So I'm looking to the younger people who are doing all that, all the work that they're doing right now to help us with that process. Yeah, that's a very inspiring note. Uh, Demita, we have a question for you while, while you're still on here uh, from Facebook, actually. Uh, this is uh, from Miranda. Miranda uh, Miranda writes, what do you think of the recent art project about the murders of black women in 1978 and 79? Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Perhaps you can speak to that. I am. I am. Kendra Hicks, uh, I believe is, I think Hicks is her last name, is the young black woman artist who put that together. I thought it was brilliant. I was not in Boston at that time, so I wasn't able to take it in at all, but I thought it was just 
it was profound on a couple of levels. The fact that um, it was reminding the city of Boston um, that for the, we have discounted an un... Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Black women's lives are very unvalued in a lot of ways still in the world. And having that project revisiting the sites of where those women's bodies were found, the fact that none of those murders were ever solved, that that continues as a thread that began then, that was preceded by 370 years, continues to today to Brianna, to every other black woman that's being murdered or killed now for whatever reason. So I thought it was brilliant. I really did. And I, I, I let Kendra know it. I felt very, um, I just felt that it was a really amazing and probative piece of work. Well, and you just gave her a shout out, so that's great. We have her li a link to, uh, to a story about that monument has been just shared in the chat box here for those who are online. That's, that's really great. Thanks for that Wonderful. question off of Facebook. More are welcome. I think we have Ben and Mark both ready to share a question or comment, and then maybe we'll take one last round of thoughts from our live audience and then go back to our guests for a closing comment or two. I know Seren had some things to say about South Africa and uh, uh, South African representation presentation and so uh, but let's first go to Ben and Mark maybe we'll take both of you and then go back to the to the panel hi thank you all thank you Saran and Ross and Tamita for these great comments um, and uh, I should say <clears throat> I'll probably go in a bit of a different direction um, I guess my my question I have two um, first is, is sort of how are we thinking about the function of of monuments um, and memorials, although I, I think we're kind of blurring some lines, uh, and maybe I'm getting into uh, what Fanon would not like in intellectualizing distinctions here, but um, because I, I don't know that they're exactly the same, um, and part of me is kind of thinking through a sort of, you know, Nietzsche and the uses and abuses, right, um, in the sense of, of what, what do monuments function for? I mean, one of the things I think of is how, sort of how they shore up states right and national belonging i think columbus um clearly ties into this um for instance so um what is the function of a monument um and how does it relate to um the sort of uh social conceptions of um uh, of shared life um and then kind of connected to that is how are we thinking about um the 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 question of public art right um, because uh, i think that's another mm -hmm. kind of um distinction where do these monuments function as public art? And if so, what is the nature of both the publicness and the artness of them? Um, which is to say like, um, once we put a monument in public space, is it public because it's out there to be seen? Because on another, uh, in another way, it sort of claims that space, right? It doesn't belong to everybody anymore. It belongs to the monument um, and orders the space around that monument in particular ways. Um, so I guess I, I just want to kind of uh, hear what y'all think of, of sort of how monuments function and, and how they relate to the question of art and the public. Okay, so uh, interesting theoretical question from Ben. Then let's go over to, uh, to Mark and then we'll come back to the three of you. Yeah, I think your comment, the way you put the, the role of monuments in establishing nation is a really interesting thing that, that we need to address and it's, it's here. Um, and I think there are some moves to some critique, and I've got to confess that I've become ever more suspicious about monuments of people, that, you know, anthropomorphic monuments um, in, in sort of succeeding in this international mission that Seren has put out, um, and thinking more about perhaps, perhaps the left should look at abstract monument. Um, and there are some roles to think about, right? There was a, a UAW mural in the early 1990s that was split between Detroit and Mexico City, which if you remember the politics around car manufacture in the early 90s, that's a pretty radical right. act right? As, a public, as an art statement. Um, and we brought up the Vietnam Memorial and Maya Lin's design, which was all about sort of the horizontal plane which in a certain respect is, a, is an artistic critique of the national heroic, right? Um, and, mm -hmm. and Dave Winters is a historian right now who's doing a lot of museum work around the centenary of World War I about the horizontal plane as a plane of mourning and contemplation and critique of national identity. 
Um, and that's in part why mm -hmm. the officer corps hated Maya Lin, but enlisted troops, a lot of them embraced Maya Lin because it gave them a place to wander down, find the name of somebody they had lost, and in that sort of mm -hmm. low area, have a space of mourning and contemplation in silence. Um, and the officer corps mm -hmm. instead got vertical heroic figures mounted on the mall for Vietnam, you know, a hundred yards away. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a way in which I, I kind of think our, 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 our representations of people in and of themselves problematic politically. I was not sad to see Stalin go, right? Um, but but some of those wonderful abstract Soviet uh, sites, boy, when I see them destroyed, it sort of breaks my heart, right? Because they, they gave me kind of a dream that the heroic individual didn't. Um, and I wonder, what mm -hmm. do you think about that in terms of a progressive form of art? Great. I think those two questions work really well together, actually. And uh, I would invite all three speakers to speak to either or both. They're big questions too, so I'm gonna go, take a moment. I'm just being. I'm. I'm waiting for someone to start. Well, I could buy you some time, but I think Saran. Saran, you're muted. Okay. Yeah, I've been busy muting and unmuting people. Forgot to do it for myself. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the things I I I've uh, really noticed over the years is that. Memorials uh, are very easily monuments to nation building. So you think about the, um, you know, the various 911 kinds of memorials, which are uh, uh, which exist in service of an, an imperial project to invade and subordinate other countries. So, so in that sense, memorials, uh, you know, can often play that play the role of monuments. Um, and I want to contrast that with the kind of art that uh, Miranda Wright asked about, the murders of black women, a people's kind of art, uh, you know, and obviously the yeah. scale and form is different in the way that Mark Soderstrom indicated, the UAW kind of art. So the kinds of art that people, that people's movements can create are very different. I'll, I'll give you one example since I, um, I had hoped to speak a little bit about South Africa. Um, I come from the city of Port Elizabeth, that's uh, part of what's called the Nelson Mandela Bay Metro. And uh, in fact, one of its future names might be Nelson Mandela City, you know. Um, but everything in our city is named mm. after Nelson Mandela. And, uh, and I certainly was part of uh, the organization. He helped lead the African National Congress before it became a, a, a neoliberal organization. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm not opposed to things being named after Mandela, but you know, for most of the educated folks on this call, they would have heard the name Steve Biko, who was also a, um, mm, a mm -hmm. city, Port Elizabeth. In fact, in, 19, in September, 1977, that was where he was killed by the uh, Bureau of State Security in a building called mm -hmm. uh, San Lam and uh, made famous by the Peter Gabriel song or made notorious by the Peter Gabriel yeah. song, Biko. But there isn't a single monument um, to this day to uh, Steve Biko or no, no memorial. And I felt that way until my daughter and I went walking around in downtown Port Elizabeth, the central business district. And right outside that building, um, I saw someone had spray painted a silhouette of Biko on a major pillar mm. right the road. And, and in some ways, for me, that was really an appropriate kind of memorial to Biko because he represents a figure not in power, but really a people's figure. And uh, even though we may have quibbles, you know, with, with the nature of his reading of black consciousness and its relevance to today's, uh, you know, uh, neoliberal government in South Africa. Um, I, I think that that's the kind of monument we'd like to see. Just one more point about other kinds of monuments in South Africa. In, in 1985, uh, the 1980s was a period of rebellion and, and potential revolution in South Africa, when the urban working classes rose up against the state forcing the state to occupy townships. 
And uh, so armed forces, much like the invasion of Fallujah, went into the townships, right? And tore down houses. Mm -hmm. It resulted in a white um, resistance movement against conscription into the army. And of course, a much larger scale rebellion against the township occupations. So in 1985, there was a massacre in a town called Langa, in, um, just in the Nelson Mandela Metro as well. Um, and 25 people were killed. I knew about it. I was out of the country at the time, but my father was one of the doctors responding to the, to the shootings that, that killed 25 people and wounded countless others, right? And uh, with the transition to our neoliberal democracy in the early 1990s, right, between 1990 and 1994, what happened was there was a, a, a really dignified plaque put up commemorating the martyrs of that massacre, right? Um, about 10 years later, someone had stolen that, uh, that plaque and sold it for scrap metal. Mm. And I don't want to condemn that person. I want to condemn the government that has left that community as impoverished as it is. So that uh, right. to turn to those methods. And so for me, again, I want to go back to the point that I opened this conversation with, um, which is we have to look at the underlying cleavages as we consider monuments. So I, I'm afraid I, I mm. sort of ducked Ben Stork's question. <laughs> and um, we'll leave it to Ross, a public historian, to, to untangle if he chooses to. Well, I think Ben agreed. No, I thought it was great. Thank you, Siren. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, Seren. Ben appreciated in the chat box your reference to graffiti, which he was interested in counterposing to memorial or monument in the state kind of sanctioned way. So I think you did justice to his question in your own way, Seren. So, so no worries. Ross and Demita, lots on the table here, as well as other additional thoughts you'd like to bring into play before we move towards wrap, wrapping up. Ross, Demita? Well, no, Ross, please. All right, Ross, and we'll close with Demita. I don't have anything particularly brilliant to say. <laughs> I was going to take a shot, but to me to go ahead. <laughs> well, this is the thing I was thinking. This is a, it's interesting to have this conversation, not looking at one another. I, I'm finding that fascinating. However, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this time that we're living in, where we're thinking about how we want and what do we want to be represented? What do we want to see every day walking to the bus, walking to the train? Mural, what kinds of things? And I'm realizing we're in a position in a time period where there's a lot of transformation taking place. So for a while, the things that we memorialize or the things that we create might really be evanescent, right? Not, might not be permanent because in so many ways, the ways in which we're breaking open the forbidden subject of white supremacy, the ways in which we're confronting power state power and it's in its complete oh i was going to swear but i won't i'm trying to work on that the complete um need to confront the way state power is being exercised currently and the way it's been exercised from the beginning in this country we're having these conversations and so some of the things that we create that represent what we think what we see what we feel right now i think i might, might end up being trans sort of transitional and I'm really looking to, whenever I go to demonstrations, when I go to um, events where people are talking, I'm always noticing the artifacts, the things that people bring to put up, the memorials that are created to the dead, all these things that we do right now that really memorialize and capture emotion as well as intellect. I'm excited about that. So I'm not sure where we're going to go in the end, but we have a chance to really um, do a reset and a redo, and I'm hopeful. Yeah. The that, end. That's, that's great. No, I mean, that, I think your enthusiasm, even without seeing your face, Demita, your enthusiasm has come, th come through strong, I think, and hopefully uh, it's come back to you from us as well. Ross, would you like to, to, to add, a, you know, add a closing thought as well before we, before we wrap up? I'll try. I was going to try to say something to, to Ben's question about the, the function of monuments. And uh, I'm honestly struggling ah. to kind of wrap my head around it because I, I've always thought of it more in terms of uh, intentions. And, you know, mm -hmm. monuments, they're, they're interpretive. It, it, it's hard to really 
measure the way that people interact with these monuments, the amount of critical reflection they put in as they're interacting with them. But I feel like I have mm -hmm. a pretty clear understanding of what, for example, in the case of the Christopher Columbus statues, what the Italian American community intended as they're resurrecting this monument or erecting this monument. Um, whether it had functioned in the way that they intended it to function, I don't really know. But, uh, you know, Columbus, I think I mentioned a, a little bit earlier, it was already a symbol that had a certain amount of currency with it, but it was primarily like embedded within this uh, myth of the American frontier, the American sort of like mm -hmm. uh, march to, to progress and uh, American civilization versus barbarism, that whole sort of thing. It was, an, it was a symbol embedded within that sort of narrative. And then as mm -hmm. the Italian American mm -hmm. community is confronting like real racist violence, and you know it has its civic leaders trying to renegotiate Italian racial identity within the black-white binary that I mentioned earlier. They seize upon this Columbus, yes. character, appropriate him, project this, nat this national identity onto him that he didn't have. He wasn't Italian, um, and the intention was clear. You know, it was it was self-defense. It was a kind of self-defense, deeply ironic, mm -hmm. as Nita pointed out, and uh, it might have worked. The intentions might have had the uh, um, function, might have been that what was intended. I hope that that's the that right. question. I don't have much more than that. Perhaps Sock would have been. Yeah, that's really powerful, Ross. I mean, I think the way you all have opened up the past, the present, and the future, the possible futures out of that today has been really inspiring as well as illuminating. Uh, I was just jumping in there, Ross, with a provocation. I wonder if Sacco and Vanzetti could be reclaimed, you know, uh, in ways, you know, in mm. place of Columbus. There certainly are no shortage of options. I don't see it, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure he's on someone's list to be taken down if they put yeah, it Yeah, right. Um, Tesla, so, Tesla. <laughs> yeah, um, no, but it's really been great speaking with you. I think as Tim, our, one of our producers, said in the chat box, this has been a really great kind of roundtable with a lot of voices today. And I want to welcome you all back next week. We will have actually another Shelter and Solidarity Roundtable, even more round than today. We are asking all of you to share <laughs> with us the thoughts that, and your thoughts about what you've been watching and what you've been reading and what you've been learning during this pandemic, as so many of us have been when we're not out protesting, shut in, whether we like it or not. Uh, we'd like to mine that knowledge that you all and that experience. What have you been watching? Possibly what have you been reading as well, if you're actually reading some books? And uh, what have you been learning for, from it that you think is relevant to this moment and that you want to share with folks? So um, join us next week at 7 o'clock. Again, as usual, Eastern Standard Time, and we will continue the discussion. What are we watching? What are we reading? And what are we learning? The week after that, we'll actually have Mark Soderstrom on the show, along with Linda Liu and, and others, to talk about dystopian fiction and film in particular, the disaster and the end of the world on the screen and how that relates to the various ends of the world and the struggle in the world we're witnessing right now. I want to thank uh, Shelter and Solidarity co-producers, Seren Mudliar, Linda Liu, Tim Sheard, Kira Mudliar, as well as our, um, our sponsors, the journal Socialism and Democracy, as well as Hardball Press, a publisher of working class stories, Labor Press, and Encuentro Cinco, a hub for organizing community and revolution in the heart of downtown Boston. Thank you all for being here today. And if you want to stick around and debrief for a few minutes after we stop broadcasting, you're welcome to do that. Take care and see you next week. <laughs>